Hello and welcome to this final first look exploring session looking at Patient Grizzle or Grizzle or however you want to say it uh, or for that matter spell it uh, there are some variations uh, by Decker, Chettle and Horton uh, we are two thirds of the way through the play and we're going to find out whether the ending is going to um, be slightly more cheerful than frankly the where the rest of the play is taking us we found it a very fascinating and engaging text to work with but it's it's not a play that has a central plot line that we're really keen on so um uh but we have been finding possible angles uh, that uh, that give us some 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 measure of hope but there is a question here very much going to be a question of how it lands and how it ends as to how it all it all goes. Um, but uh, to find out how it ends, as we go from Act 4, Scene 3, to the end of the play, uh, reading today Sir Owen and Pavia is... I'm not muted. Oh, good. Uh, hi, I'm Lynn. I am coming to you today from the northwestern United States. Uh, reading Farnese, Babulo and Lepido is... Uh, I'm Lois and I'm in London. Uh, reading The Marquis is... I'm Alexandra, and I'm in a place with poor connections, so if I freeze up, it's with excitement. Uh, <laughs> reading Julia today is... Hello, I'm Lalit. I'm perched on the periphery of Paris. Uh, reading uh, Lorio and uh, some beggars is... Bryony Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. Uh, reading Gwenthian, Mario and Grissel is... Hi, I'm Eric, and you won't regret this at all. Neither will <laughs> I. <laughs> Reading Reese, uh, Chenze, and Furio is. Hi, my name is Elizabeth the Misu, and I'm an author based in the southeast of England in Romford. Uh, reading Beggar Number One, Onofrio and Janiculo is. Alan, very poor in Suffolk. Uh, I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading Stage Directions. Oh, how lovely to be able to just say that and not say and other stuff as well, because it's been chaotic this week. And so this this is quite... Oh, it's almost relaxing. Uh, act four, then. Act four, scene three. Enter Gwenthian and Reese. She meanly, he like a cook. Reese, lay her table and set out her victuals and bread and wines and ale and peer and salt for her guests. Yes, forsooth, my lady. But what shall I do with all yonder beggars? Send the beggars into her lady, go. How? The beggars in? We shall have a lousy feast, madam. You rascal, parade no more, but fetch them in. And sit Reese. Though Priddle, Sir Owen, a good deal well enough is more than her. Sir Owen is gone to bid her cousin Marquis and may, a many to dine at her house, but... Gwentian shall give her dinner. I want her for peckers. Shall have all her meat. Uh, enter Reese with a company of beggars. A table is set with meat. Come, my hearts. Troop, troop. Every man follow his leader. Here's my lady. God bless your ladyship. God, God bless, bless your ladyship. ladyship. Oh. I thank you, my good beggars. Please bring stools. Settle down. Please bring more meat. Here, madam. I'll set it on. Take it off, who will? So learn Let that, us my lady. That, my lady. Shall we scramble? scramble or eat mannerly? <laughs> Beggars, I hope I have no manners, but first hear me pray you now and then fall out to, to out, then fall to out cry. Peace. I hear my lady. Jack Mumble, Jack Mumble Chris. Still no penny loans. Peggers, all you know, sir, own. Passing well. Passing well. God bless his worship. Madam, we know him as well as a beggar knows his dish. All these actuals is made for Cousin Marcus. Sir Owen is going to fetch it, but for, for Sir Owen has angered for lady. Or shame for him. He's not a knight, but a knitter of caps for it. Sir Owen is angered her lady, and therefore her lady is angered Sir Owen. Make him a cuckold, madam. And upon that I drink to you. Elder Skelter here. Rogues, top and gallant. Hell, mel, hufty tufty, em, um, God save the duke and a fig for the hangman. Please fetch wine and peer enough and fall too, Peggy, and eat all her sheer and tomnier. See you now, pray do. A drunken feast, they quarrel and grow drunk and pocket up the meat. 
the dealing of cans like a set at more exit Reese. Nay, I pray, Peckers, be quiet. Take your meats. You have drinks enough, I see, and see, get you home now, good Peckers. Come me, rogues. Let's go. Tag and rag. Cut long tail. I'm vittle for a month. Goodbye, madam. Pray God, Sir Owen and you may fill out every day. Is there any harm in this now? Hey, Trelil, give the dog a loaf. Build t'other pot. You're and God save the Duke. I thank you, good beggars. Exuant beggars. <laughs> this is fine sport by God. I have beggars and eat her victuals all day long. Enter Sir Owen and Rhys. Where is the cheer, Rhys? God's blood where? I beseech you, sir, be patient. I tell you, the beggars have it. What a pox to do, is do with beggars? I want his beggars at our next house. Is beggars Sir Owen's guests, Rhys? No, Sir Owen. They were my lady's guests. <gasps> ha! You hungry rascals! But where's poor lady Gwentian Cuts blood? Peckers eat her chair. A cousin Margaret's come? I know not where my lady is, but there's a beggar woman. Ask her, for my lady dealt her arms amongst them, her, them herself. A pug's on you, beggar whore. Where's the bread and cheer? God, touch me, I'll pegger you for victuals. Hold, hold, hold. What is mad now? Here is her lady. Is her lady pegger, you rascals? No, sweet madam. You are my lady. A man is a man, though he have but a hose on his head. And you are my lady, though you want a hood. How now? How now? Ha! Ha! Her lady in tawny coat and tags and rags so? Where is her meat? Gwentian, where is her cheer? Her cousin Marcus is here, a great deal of shanty folk and ladies and florids by and by. What care her for the ladies or cousin too? Fiddles are all gone. How? Gone? Is her lady mad? No, her lord is mad. You tear her ruffs and repetos and prattle her. Is her prattled now? Is her repetled now? Is her tear in pieces now? <laughs> Teach I, I, her, teach her, prattle her lady again. Her cousin Marquis shall eat no bread and meat here, and her lady Gwentian will go in her tags and rags and like beggar to vex and chafe her own. See you, see you now. See you now. A, a pug's seat her. Cut blood. What is do now, Reese? Speak her fair, master, for she looks wildly. Is look wildly indeed. Gwentian, pray you go in and put bravery upon her pack and belly. God put me is by new repartos and ruffs for her lady. Pray do so, pray, good lady. Do, good madam. Cartho Krog, Cartho Krog, Gwentian scorn her flatteries. Her lady go no better. Sir Owen hang herself. Oh no, I'm sorry. That yeah. went, <laughs> my dad. <laughs> Cartho Krog, Cartho Krog, Gwentian scorns her flatteries, her lady go no better. Sir Owen hang herself. Oh, Moniago, her British blood is not endured by God. A pug's on her. Put on her fine coats is best. Put on, go to put on. Put off, Sir Owen, and she'll put on. A pox on her is put on none but go like beggar. Reese. Go mage more fire and let her have more shear. This mage fire and I'll scold her like pig seam. I shall be peppered. Howe'er the market goes. May great teal of fires, Sir Owen shall nog your ears. Make little teal of fire or Gwentian shall eat, cut off your ears and pub and pub you, Reese. See you now. Hold, good madam, I see you and feel you too. You're able to set stones together by the ears. I beseech you be quiet both. I'll make a fire, Sir Owen, to please you. Do, Rhys, I'll bridle her ladies well enough. Will you, rascal? Nay, but 
But hear you, sweet madam, I'll make a fire to please Sir Owen, and when it burns, I'll quench it to please you. Exit Reese. Enter Farnese apace. Uh, why, how now, Sir Owen? Your cousin the Marquis and all your guests are at hand, and I see no meat towards. Is no meat toward, but her lady is fairy toward. <laughs> what, what baggage is this stands laughing thus? A pog's on her. Tis our lady baggage, tis Gwentian. Oh, my lady Gwentian. <laughs> And, uh, yes, the guests are about to arrive, but we'll pause there. So, um, sorry, darling, uh, while you're out, uh, the, 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 the dinner's in the beggars. Um, uh, oh, have we got guests? Oh, well. Um, whoops. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Yes, within the uh, the, uh, the the usual uh, sort of cold read issues that we have with uh, with these characters, uh, the energy is strong here, and um, there's some lovely lines. I did like some of the beggars' lines. I did like, uh, "Shall we scramble or eat mannerly?" I think that's one that's that's one for uh, for for occasions to ask around the table, isn't it? <laughs> um, Definitely using that in the future. That's that's one to have uh, printed on on you know uh, on uh, uh, yeah. napkin wear um, and, oh. and things. Little table tents, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, and uh, yeah, the, uh, the lots of business with uh, with the beggars and, um, and, and and stuff going on there. Uh, and then yes, uh, conflict and uh, and and uh, back and forth between uh, Gwenty and and Sir Owen um, and Reese trying to play piggy in the middle. I think uh, er Eric. Yeah, I, I, I like how it's kind of uh, she's pissed off at him because you know they pissed each other off. I, I don't know what happened. I wasn't here for the previous sessions, but um, uh, I, I like the idea that instead of giving him the silent treatment, which is what would happen in a modern comedy nowadays, uh, they just she just kind of gives the food away to people who actually need it. Um, and also, I didn't know the beggars have houses. I, I, I assumed like most like most of the beggars from this time period were homeless. I don't know. Maybe that's just me or a stereotype. I don't know. Well, as we all know from that documentary, The Blind Beggar of Bethnal Green, <laughs> they have a cottage. Um, all of their very or own. Shit. Or a shed, depending on your point of view. So yeah, I I think there might there might be variations on on the kind of establishment that beggars uh, might be uh, uh, found at, but I genuinely don't know. It's a good it's a good question. Uh, Lynn. Well, yeah, we think of beggars as being as being houseless, but um, I I don't know. Beggars might be used rather loosely here. Wealthy families were expected to offer hospitality to their less fortunate neighbors on a regular basis you were talking the other day about you know one of the disadvantages of being lord mayor is you were expected to have yeah. lavish hospitality all it, it, all the time and it was really quite expensive so that might be kind of what's going on here is like they're maybe not beggars literally but the but they're poor folk neighbors and she's decided to feed them all the nice food instead of her her royal guests just to piss her husband off yeah. uh, and it works um Oh, and just sort of a, a, a side note, we were wondering out loud yesterday what this Rapato thing is, and, and I looked it up, and it's and actually, it's like, there's an entry for it on Wikipedia. It is one of those big standing roughs that uh, were quite fashionable about, about this time. So there's the, the, the classic early modern Renaissance rough, and then the Rapato is like this big wired, you know, the evil queen kind of thing uh <laughs> so yeah um yes yeah, so he like he i don't know he, he, he maliciously or accidentally or you know whatever he tore her pretty her pretty accessories and she's pissed off about it. Mm, yeah um that 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 it's a, there is a sort of ongoing tit for tat battle between them basically isn't there there's no there's no uh, the, uh negotiation reese is trying to do negotiation it's not working is it um <laughs> there's no arbitration uh for in this relationship at this this particular time yeah. um other he, thoughts he, before yeah, we... sell, you know? <laughs> yeah uh eric wasn't that also what they'd set up at the beginning where far Eze and um, the other guy, or Chense, I think, or whatever his name was, um, had uh, set up, like, you know, she's just going to walk all over him and basically, like, 
it's going to be a relationship based on conflict mm. rather than because you know, they're both passionate people rather mm. than um anything else yeah, we have that sort of early scene uh, with, with Julia as well, uh, where they're basically just going, this relationship is going to be a disaster. Um, and and lo and behold, they were right. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, so they've got guests. They've got no food. This is, this is going to go well, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so enter uh, to them, uh, enter the Marquis, Julia, Onefrio, uh, Chenze and Mario. You see, Sir Owen, we are soon invited. Where is your wife, the Lady Gwenthian? It's come by and by. God, oh, to me, Gwenthian, pray, put on your bravery and find next and shame not, Sir Owen. Yes, truly, Gwenthian is come out by and by. Man, a grass worth me, a cousin Marquis, man, grass worth we. Cousin Julia is welcome all. Ha ha, welcome. Uh, come, come, madam, appear in your likeness, or rather in the likeness of another. Uh, my lord, you're best send back to your own cooks if you mean to set your teeth a work today. <clears throat> Why, Farnese, what's the matter? <laughs> Nay, there's no matter in it. The fire is quenched, the victuals given to beggars. Sir Owen's kitchen looks like the first chaos, or like a broker's stall full of odd ends, or like the end of some terrible battle. Uh, for upon every dresser lies legs and feathers and heads of poor capons and wild fowl that have been drawn and quartered, and now mourn that their carcasses are carried away. Uh, his are not rheumatic, for there is no spitting, here lie fish in a pitiful pickle. There stand the coffins of pies, wherein the dead bodies of birds should have been buried, but their ghosts have forsaken their graves and walked abroad. The best sport is to see the scullions, some laughing, some crying, and whilst they wipe their eyes, they black their faces. <laughs> the cooks curse her lady, and some pray for our Lord. Oh, in Meredith, is this all true? True, it is true. I warrant her, a pug's on her, too true. Told his grace, you had tamed your wife. By God, is tell her a lie then, for a wife is prided and tamed, who are indeed C cousin Marquis. Penalized Grisful is made a fool and turn away. Gwenthian made fool of Sir Owen, it's good. Ah, it's good. This lie, cousin Marquis, is terrible lie. Twas in no twelve. Tis lie, tis lie. To sir own tear her potatoes and ruffs and prattle her latte and 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 bid her lang herself, uh, her hang herself. But is prattle. I I I warrant her. It's not sir own. I don't like we be talking no one is employing Nay, Bethel in Slonai na waffle get a tea. What says she, Sir Owen? I pray and pray her for God's love be quiet. Splut, her say her will not be quiet. Do what Sir Owen can. Mon do, Gwenthian, me knock seppin in umblech probedes in probenosa. Gwenoch och vesach we in hera we. Julia? Who's Julia? Sorry, I did say the line. My, I was not connected. Oh. Stand between them, Farnese. <laughs> you shall bob no nose here. And here we may grab it. The, the legacy uh, Athlon of, of Bendy uh, Adro um, or Nimi on Dictar and Hacker. -y. Does she threaten you, Sir Owen? Find us of the peace. Be God, 
you threaten her in teeth, her says she'll scratch out Sir Owen's eyes and her frown upon her, a pugs on her nails. In your Mario, say oh, nothing. Oh, my dear Grizzle, how much different art thou to this cursed spirit here? I say, my Grizzle's <clears throat> virtues shine. Sir Meredith and Cousin Gwenthian, come, I'll have you friends. This dinner shall be saved, and all shall say it is done because tis Gwenthian's fasting day. Gwenthian scorns to be friends. Her lady will be master, Sir Owen. By God, I'll see her lady hanged first. Cousin Marquis and cousins all, pray take time and stay here. Reese shall dress more victuals and shall dine here in spite of her lady. God's blood. Reese! Reese! And exit Sir Owen. Will you? Let's try the time part. Stith the wee lower, cousin Marquis, stith wee lower. Gentlemen, Gwenthian is not prideled so soon. Exit Gwenthian. I'll see the peace kept sure. Do what he can. I doubt his wife will prove the better man. Exit Marquis. Signor Mario, you say nothing. I like you this interlude. So well, madam, that I rather wish to play the beggars than the king's part in it in Sir Owen's apparel. <laughs> Why, this it is to be married. Thus you see... Those that go to woo, go to woe. Oh, for a drum to summon all my lovers, my suitors, my servants together. I appear, sweet mistress, without summons. So does Onofrio. So does Ocenze. Signor Emulo, I see, will not be seen without calling. Uh, no, faith, madam, he's blown up. No calling can serve him. He's ta'en another manner of calling upon him, and I hope repents the folly of his youth. If he follow that vocation well, he'll prove wealthy in wit. He had need, for his head is very poor. Well, mistress, we appear without drumming. What's your parley? And yet not so. Your eyes are the drums that summon us. And your beauty the colours we fight under. The touch of your soft hand arms us at all points with devotion to serve you, desire to obey you, and vows to love you. Nay then, in faith, make me all soldier. Mine eyes a drum, my beauty your colours, and my hand your armour. What becomes of the rest? Oh, it becomes us to rest before we come to the rest. Yet for a need, we could turn you into an armory, as, for example, your lips, uh, let me see, no point of war for your lips. Uh, can I put them to no use but kissing? Oh, yes, if you charge them to shoot out unkind language to us that stand at your mercy, they are two culverins to destroy us. That I'll try. My tongue shall give fire to my words presently. Oh, be merciful, merciful fair, fair Julia. Yeah. Not I. <laughs> Would you have me pity you and punish myself? Would you wish me to love when love is so full of hate? How unlovely is love? How bitter, how full of blemishes. My lord and brother insults our gristle, makes me glad. Gwenethin curbs Sir Owen, that makes you glad. Sir Owen is mastered by his mistress, that makes you mad. Poor Grissel is martyred by her lord. That makes you merry. For I always wish that a woman may never be, meet better bargains when she'll thrust her sweet liberty into the hands of a man. Fie upon you. You're nothing but wormwood and oak and glass. You have bitter tongues, hard hearts, and a brittle faith. Dear must not till you try our loves. Sweet servant, speak not in this language of love. Gwynthian's peevishness and Grissel's patience make me here to defy that ape Cupid. If you love, stand upon his laws. I charge you leave it. I charge you neither to sigh for love, nor speak of love, nor frown for hate. If you sigh, I'll mock you. If you speak, I'll stop my ears. If you frown, I'll bend my fist. Uh, then you'll turn warrior indeed. Had I not need, encountering such enemies, but say, will you obey and follow me or disobey and I'll fly you? 
I obey, since it is your pleasure. I obey, though I taste no pleasure in it. I obey too, but so God help me, mistress, I shall show you a fair pair of heels and cry a new mistress, a new, if any pitiful creature will have me. Better lost than found, if you be so wavering. Enter Marquis Lepidoso in Gwynethian Brave and Furio. Furio, hide thee to old Janiculos. You charge him, his daughter Grissel, and his son to come to court to do such office of duty to our marriage as shall like our state to lay upon them. Oh, my lord, vex not poor Grissel more. Alas, her heart. Tut tut, I'll have my will and tame her pride. I'll make her be a servant to my bride, Julia. I'll bridle her. You do her wrong. Sister, correct that error. Come, Sir Owen. Is not this better music than your brawls? Yes, it's quite odd me. How cousin Julia is out of cry friends now. Gwenthian is love and be very patient now. Sir Owen kiss her lady a great deal now. See else. Ay, but Sir Owen, the kissing her lady is no mirth to us if we kiss the post. Oh, her cousin Marquis has terrible mighty news to tell her, or else is made ready a great banquet at home for all. Pray come home, is all ready for her. Her lady say not bo peep now, but first hear her cousin Marquis news. Julia. And gentlemen, these are the news brought on the wings of haste and happiness by trusty Lepido. Our endeared brother is hard at hand, who in his company brings my fair second choice, a worthy bride attended by the states of Pavia. She's daughter to the Duke of Brandenburg. Thou shalt no subject's envious soul repine and call her base, who now I will make mine. None shall upbraid me now as they have done that I will slay a daughter and a son. Grissel's two babes are dead and killed by scorn, but that fair issue that shall now be born shall make a satisfaction of all wrongs. Come, gentlemen, we will go meet this train that every one put on a smiling brow. <laughs> Sir Owen, I will have your company and yours fair cousin, well remembered, to bring your three wands, Sir Owen, to the court. The Gwenthian look with a smoother eye, I'll teach you how to win the sovereign tie. It's glad of that. <laughs> Take heed of wands, lady. Take heed of nails, knight. We play the unthrifts in consuming time. Though your cursed wife makes some afraid to woo, yet I'll woo once more and be married too. God urge me, Sir Owen would hang before Mary once more if I were another bachelor. Mary, oh! And they exit. Yeah, Marquis throwing an interesting curveball at the end of the scene, the scene which otherwise had been quite fun until the Marquis started saying words. Um, it's just it's just something about the Marquis. You know, people are having fun or, you know, you know, there seems to have been some kind of uh, reproach, uh, 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 pulling together of uh, Sir Owen uh, in the offstage moments. But we've we've had several really good speeches in this scene. Um, you know, first, uh, Farnese's really nice um, <laughs> speech about the, the chaos in the kitchen, which is oh, just a very nicely removable. I like that. That's really good. Oh. Then we've got Julia and her... I, I mean, the relationship between the th her and the three men is... is uh, She's really got them... Uh, uh, she's uh, got them know. by the balls. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that 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 could be very interestingly costumed if you took it out of context. Um. Uh, so yeah, there's um there's uh there's some very interesting things going on there, and uh, and then as I say this sort of curveball at the end. Um, where the Marquis sets up the action for the final act. Um, yeah, thoughts in the room on all of that. Some 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 really good stuff. Some interesting stuff. Some you know, stuff. Uh, Eric then Lynn. It seems a bit like um. 
basically like the Proverbs by John Haywood, which we've not read yet, but I've edited, as you know, uh, which is basically about why you should not get married. Um, <laughs> and it just, it seems to be turning into like a morality play almost uh, like sort of against, like these are the, the counterpoints against getting married. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Julia will, uh, my prediction for like the end of this is that she will sort of, uh, Julia will get her comeuppance in like being falling in love, that kind of shit. Um, yeah, possibly. I don't know if Julia's going to fall in love. She, 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 but yeah, there's... a bit late in the day, isn't it? We're we're kind of at Act Five. It's... Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> she might get married, uh, but yeah. I, 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 I don't, I love. don't suspect there'll be love. Um, just by the nature of of what what's happening with her so far, she's got plenty of suitors to choose from. It's just they're all. Mm -hmm. They're all sort of equally non-entities, really. Um, so, <laughs> for Anasi, I think the closest one to having an actual character, and then the other two are just there. Um, I don't think we've really detected characters for the others. Uh, sorry, Lynn. Yeah, the, after this scene, I'm sort of wishing that the Julia plot had been a little more developed. I'll just be, I think she's so interesting. So she's the Marquis's sister, and obviously beautiful and accomplished and highly desirable. So she has all these men. Um, uh, paying court to her uh, but she's also kind of trying to educate them you know she says if my choices are basically put up with all the shit your husband gives you the way Gristle has has been forced to do or to just be a raging harpy the way Gwenthian is is behaved if those are my choices I'll stay single like that doesn't like Cupid can just can just keep his little <laughs> his games you know, and they're all like, oh, but we love you. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah, so you know, Julia seems to be the place attempt to kind of find a middle ground um, where, where the the extremes of, of Gwenthian and, 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 and Gristle are, <laughs> not, neither of them seem to be a, per, a terribly healthy or sustainable solution. Yeah, I mean, Julia's place, I mean, I, I, the, the reason why I'm, I'm not sort of seeing her, you know, any action involving her is I don't think she is there for action. She's there to comment on mm -hmm. the threads of the other plot lines um, the, the, to, to put into re sharp relief the, uh, the issues that the play have been raising, um, or at least play with them a bit um, as she plays with her suitors. Um, I mean, she in a sense, she's get, you know, she gets adulation, she presumably gets gifts. Um, and if, if the, the, the choices of the next stage are, are what she's seeing, yeah, why, why, why go there? Um, <laughs> Uh, really minor point. Um, yes. This is, uh, I recently got a book as part of my teaching, um, Mrs. Cromwell's cookbook, which is a spoof cookbook um, made to criticise the Cromwell's yeah. running of court. And coffins, I, I hadn't realised that coffins were pastry cases. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if, it, I suddenly thought, are there loads more puns around death and eating and putting people in pies because yeah. of that word? Because I, I hadn't come across it before, but it's obviously... I don't know if anyone <laughs> has um, yeah. seen that. Yeah. I don't know so far. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I've come across the term coffin for the pastry case mm. uh, because basically it was, it was a way of cooking before they had things like cooking tins. Mm. Um, you cooked in it and effectively the coffin would then be discarded or possibly like the, um, the lower crust of the trenches given to the poor because oh. it will absorb some of the meat juices and therefore contained a little nutrition. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's also the dynamics of the scene that we've uh, got in play here. Uh, you know, the Sir, Sir Owen and Gwen, uh, Gwen, uh, Gwenthian uh, scene when they come up and they start speaking in Welsh and obviously it's a cold read and uh, you know, whether it has any relation to actual welsh doesn't <laughs> matter um but you know the, uh, 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 for this kind of read it naturally slows down whereas of course i imagine it's going incredibly fast that basically they're ignoring everybody else and just going da -da 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 at each other <laughs> and and it, it, the, the the dynamics and then it's pulled back by the uh the marquis and others uh of uh going ah, you know maybe maybe we'll 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 uh, take this in another direction uh lois if we ever uh, put this on, I suppose we'll have to get all that written as real Welsh in case there's anybody in the audience who actually does know Welsh. Mm. 
uh, uh, Alexandra. I also think I had a thought about just the comedy of this uh, Welsh exchange, Welsh accent it exchange um, that, um, and this may be true of the rest of, of the play, that I think it needs to be in a way that if you do it in a modern production, uh, it needs to be done in a way that you're not mocking the accent, you are laughing at the things that they are saying because the actual information is funny. Um, and I think it's difficult to achieve that with the the, the idiosyncratic way in which the, the uh, this is written, um, whilst also trying to make sure that an audience makes sense of the things that are being said. Because I imagine that there's comedy there, I just haven't been able to pick it up just because of how it's written. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, other thoughts before we move on? Eric? Well, I guess also in this case, it's situational comedy because basically they're arguing about like a sort of domestic matter, but in, well, basically a private matter, but in, in public, um, in a public context. So it's also kind of basically everyone is going, we can't really understand why you're arguing. And then even when it's explained, uh, the others don't really seem to care very much. <laughs> they're just like, hey, TV, popcorn, or, you know, kind of fun comedy times. And, you know. mm. uh, Lois. Yeah, I think the way to do this would be either uh, if you could afford it, simultaneous translation in subtitles in the Welsh bits, uh, or maybe Reese holding up uh, something which has it written, you know, a large uh, 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 spreadsheet or something with, with the lines on them. I mean, to 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 a degree, the, the those but it doesn't really. I mean, it does matter, but it doesn't you know, because it's incredibly fast and it's the sort of climax of the of the scene. I, I'm not sure that the audience knowing what precisely what they're saying is is the important point at that moment. Um, obviously, the actors know, need to know what they're saying and it needs to be comprehensible, but it isn't actually structurally important. Um, you know, the data. It, uh, you know, that doesn't doesn't fundamentally change the the, the way you take in the scene. Uh, Eric then Alexandra. Well, also, you could just use like sort of really bad, uh, you know, audio translation sort of, I mean, like, so, you know, sort of um, what's called to get the comedy out of um, not the accent or what's being said, but like the sort of, um, you know, like Alexa, translate what is being said and just like add another layer of comedy to that rather than actually making it funnier. Mm. Uh, uh, Alexandra. Um, I just wanted to point out that the argument I'm making is very much the opposite to the argument you are making, Rob, which is that not for the Welsh language, I think, yes, you could make a gag out of, they say, one line in the well, in the language, each and no one but they understands. Um, but I think the stuff that is written in, in dialect mm. needs to be understood oh, yes, yes. contextually. And, and yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, no. I, uh, the 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 the. The way it is laid out here is 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 very opaque. Uh, stuff that the audience does need to understand. Yes, absolutely. Uh, right. I don't know what about this week. The the amount of uh, Welsh accent work that we've had to do. Um, it's uh, across all of the sessions this week. It's it's just one of those 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 strange coincidences. I'd say I'd planned it. No, no, none of this is planned. It's all random chance. Um, it just goes to show how 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 things are in their moment. Uh, Patterns emerge. Anyway, we're going to go into Act Five. Uh, Act Five, Scene One. Yeah. Enter Lorio, reading. Uh, Ex student, he still wants to pick up a book, and Babulo with him. Come, I've left my work to see what matters. You mumble to yourself. Faith, Lorio, I would you could leave this lat and fall to make baskets. You think tis enough if at dinner you tell us a tale of pygmies and then munch up our victuals, but that fits not us. Or the history of the well and Helicon, and then drink up our beer? We cannot live upon it. Scholar doth disdain to spend his spirits upon such base employments as hand labours. Then you should disdain to eat us out of house and home. You stand all day peeping into an ambry there and talk of monsters and miracles and countries to no purpose. Before I fell to my trade, I was a traveller and found more in one year than you can by your poets and paltries in seven years. What wonders hast thou seen which are not here? Oh, God, I pity the, your capacity, good scholar. As a little wind makes a sweet ball smell, 
So a crumb of learning makes your trade proud. What wonders? Uh, wonders not of nine days, but 1599. I have seen under John Prester and Tamar Cam, people with heads like dogs. Alas, of such there are too many here. All Italy is full of them that snarl and bay and bark at other men's abuse, yet live themselves like beasts in all abuse. And that's true. I know many of that complexion. But I have seen many without heads having their eyes, nose and mouths in their breasts. Why, that's no wonder. Every street with us swarms full of such. Mm, I could never see them. Dost thou not see our wine belly drunkards reel? Our fat fed gluttons wallow in the streets, having no eyes but to behold their guts, no heads but brainless scalps, no sense to smell, but where full feasts abound in all excess, these epimoe be our epicures. I've seen monsters of that colour too, but what say you to them that have but one leg and yet will outrun a horse? Such are our bankrupts and our fugitives, scarce having one good leg or one good limb, outrun their creditors and those they wrong. Ah, mass, tis true. There was a cripple in our village, ran beyond Venice, and his creditors with their best legs could never since take him. But let me descend and grow lower and lower. What say you to the little pygmies, no higher than a boy's gig? and yet they tug and fight with the long-necked cranes. Oh, poor and wretched people are the pygmies. Oh, rich oppressors, the devouring cranes. Within my father's house, I'll show thee pygmies. Thou seest my sister Gristle, she's a pygmy. Oh, she's a pretty little woman indeed, but too big for a pygmy. I am a pygmy. Oh, fie, fie, worse and worse. My old father's one. No, 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 giants all. The Marquis is the rich, devouring crane that makes us less than pygmies, worse than worms. Enter Janiculo with an angling rod, gristle with a reel, and furio. Mm, yonder they come, and I crane with them. Janiculo, leave your fish catching, and you your reeling. You and you, Sirrah, you must trudge to court. Must we again be hurried from content? to live in a more grievous banishment. Methinks my lord the Marquis should be pleased with marriage of another, and forbear with trumpets to proclaim this injury, and to vex Grizzle with such lawless wrong. Is no vexation. For what pleases him is the content of his contentment of his handmaid's heart. Will you go? Yes, we will go to fly from happiness to find out woe. Oh, good Furio, vanish. We have no appetite. Tell your master. Clowns are not for the court. We'll keep court ourselves. For what do courtiers do but we do the like? You eat good cheer and we eat uh, good bread and cheese. You drink wine and we strong beer. At night you are as hungry slaves as you were at noon. Why, so are we. You go to bed. You can but sleep, why, and so do we. In the morning, you rise about 11 o'clock. Uh, why, there we are your betters, for we are going before you. You wear silks and we sheepskins. Innocence carries it away in the world to come, and therefore vanish, good Furio, torment us not, good my sweet Furio. Ass, I'll have you snuffled. Uh, it may be so, but then, Furio, I'll kick. Will you go, or shall I force you? You need not, for I'll run to serve my lord. Or if I want his legs upon my knees, I'll creep to court, so I may see him pleased. Encourage, father. Oh, said patience. Thy virtues arm mine age with confidence. Come, son, bondman must serve. Shall we away? Aye, aye, but this shall prove a fatal day. Brother, for my sake, do not wrong yourself. Shall I in silence bury all our wrongs? Yes, when your words cannot get remedy. Learn of me, Lorio, that I that share most woe am the least moved. Father, lean on my arm. Brother, lead you the way, whilst wretched I uphold old age and cast down misery. Away! 
Old master, you have fished fair and caught a frog. Uh, as they exit. Yes, that's a line for our times. Um, uh, you fished fair and caught a frog. I mean, I think we've, uh, yeah, that, that's another one. Um, Babylo, again, every so often you just get these really nice speeches, um, some really nice pop. You know, Furio turns up and says, you've got to go to court. And everyone just goes, oh, God, what's he going to do now? <laughs> oh, no. You know, we were just sort of getting our equilibrium back. We were a bit happy. And now he's just, oh, God, not you again. Um, I slightly zoned out because of a distraction uh, happening around me. Uh, uh, and there was a whole sequence about pygmies, which I, what the hell was that about? <laughs> Where, where did that come from? I, I came in sort of just as they got to it, and I'm going, <laughs> sorry, what? Uh, Lois? Well, I think uh, Laurie was just saying that, they're, uh, that they are pygmies in relation to great men. I mean, that they're small and they're being uh, trodden down. Uh, you know, and Babula's pretending not to understand him and saying, that, no, no, they're too big for pygmies. Ah, I see, I see. Um... But at least they kept it short. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Uh, we'll move on. We'll move on. Um uh yes, yeah, so yeah, it's um it it just every so often it just keeps throwing his little little curveballs that I'm just sort of going, yeah, I'm not sure what to do with that. Um and it was also slightly disappointing that Lorio he I mean he gets an interesting scene, but it's quite late in his journey to be you know, he was introduced reasonably strongly and then sort of nothing really happened with him. He's just said the odd line of dialogue and popped in and out. Um, uh, and, and there's potential here, but then again, also, as sort of the voice of the resistance, he's never really gone anywhere. Um, so that slightly disappoints me. Um, you probably uh, can't. I mean, it's, he is potentially, I think, you know, dangerous in this play. Yeah. yeah. Well, frankly, I'm surprised that Marquis hasn't made it another test and got rid of another family <laughs> member. I mean, for goodness sake, if anyone was asking asking for uh, for, for 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 death by higher powers, it, he's he's Lorio uh, because he's said pretty much from the off. Well, this is all terrible. You're a horrible person. Uh, whereas Janiculo's just gone. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, three bags full, sir. Thank you very much. Um, um, all the way through. Um. Well said, patience. No, Janik, you know, you don't seem to learn, man. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was just, there's a part where uh, basically Bristol's last speech in this scene. Um, uh, it sounds like sort of, like it could be played as passive aggressive, which confused me a bit. Like maybe it's a modern take on it, but it just sounded like, you know, I, I'm, I'm the one that's suffering the most and I'm just saying, shut up. Uh, do do as you're told kind of thing but also kind of I don't know it's just a weird sort of speech there maybe it's just me because obviously like sort of Gristle trying to sort of teach people by example doesn't seem very virtuous um, in this context maybe that's just me I think I mean she answers Laurie oh he says should I be silent she says yes when your words cannot get remedy you know what's the point <laughs> you know mm. Uh, other thoughts, uh, Elizabeth. I think there was like a groan from the audience when the Marcus was like, <laughs> And I shall test Gristle again. Mm. Just, I feel like it's overkill now. He's like had his fun, he's had his way, and he's pro he's proven beyond all doubt that she's patient. And now it's just the kind of like overegging the cake. Yes, I want to see the scene where 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 uh, Gristle's in the pub somewhere, just going, "Oh, I'm the patientest person ever," <laughs> and it's like, you know, it, it feels like, you know, that would give us at least some a reason for things to happen. Uh, uh, Alexandra, then Lois. I recall us reading another version of this same story, of which there are thousands. <laughs> um, but what I remember is that then as well, we were looking at how this. Um, the fact that she is continually patient in the same flavor of patience um, is supposed to be moralizing in its own uh, context and time. But for a modern performance, for a modern audience, it feels either flat in terms of characterization or mm -hmm. it can feel like the, the story hasn't got a journey because the characters don't have a journey. 
uh, mm. because the main character doesn't, you know, or, or plural. Yeah, because if the Marquis keeps testing her in worse and worse ways, but they are still the same flavor of nastiness, um, you know, they he's if, if his method, if his not methods, yes, if his <clears throat> um, effect is the same. But the the method only changes in that um, oh now it's about <clears throat> not eating now it's about not uh, being allowed out now it's about me marrying someone else that's just that's the same flavor of abuse if that makes sense mm. Um, mm. so yeah I think maybe that's why we're getting we're getting tired of it or we're getting sort of the feeling that why why. Oh. Is she not doing anything about mm. it? Maybe that's why, because that's kind of the point. Yeah, and, and that uh, with this play as opposed to the earlier one, um, you do feel that the playwrights are not unaware of this problem. I mean, the, hence yeah. the fact we have a subplotter that is doing something slightly more dynamic um, no. uh, with, with general uh, stuff moving around. And also the, the decision not to give him more of a reason and not to you know, that these characters are... Um, you know, they 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 are they have no journey. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the problem with the character of patience is 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 some um, there's there's nowhere to go, and the Marquis to a similar degree. Um, the, at least with the Marquis, they've given slightly more florid <clears throat> dialogue, so at least they've got um, you know, the actor has something to do. Um, uh, Lois, then Eric, then Lynn. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we do get a bit of. Uh... A critique of Lorio as well, very much in the line of the Parnassus plays, you know, that uh, uh, here is somebody who's basically a peasant who's been educated to the point where he's not willing to do manual work because he's a scholar, you know, he's moved up a social class. I mean, which is true. I mean, if you've got a, a BA or an MA, you can write Esquire after your name. <laughs> mm. Oh, uh, Eric. I was just going to say for the about the Grizel um, or Grizzle or whatever uh, problem uh, sort of Marquis Grizel really Marquis relationship. You could also, if you wanted to, sort of psychological take on it, which obviously I can't give because I'm not. Uh, I, I, like, I, this is a cold read, as we know. Um, you could sort of play her as having a sort of Stockholm syndrome in a way, like sort of being overly attached to this new person uh, who is sort of because like I, I know a lot of sort of I mean I know Sarah would tell us like what's the psychological angle on this um and just sort of yeah that might be a way of doing it if you really want to perform this but I don't know why you would well I mean there's an interesting question here because I'm not sure that she I, I, the, the the those who've read Gristle might ha know contradict me on this point but I don't think she's ever really talked about the Marquis in terms of love it's always about propriety and about the thing that you should do and that's that seems to be the, the driving force so it's more like overweening social convention um, is dr driving this rather than you know oh I love him therefore I must obey him kind of thing uh so it's it is sense uh, but I, I could be wrong on that point uh lynn then alexandra then we should move on yeah i you know i i i agree that in the in her language it's definitely this is just basically the right thing to do is it seems to be the only thing gristle comes close to articulating you know the question of motivation is it's really tricky because i think rob was saying something like this yesterday that even if it's not there on paper and we can't find it as we read through it. If you have actors inhabiting those parts on stage, your audience is going to be looking for motivation or projecting it onto them. They're going to have to come up with something because that's kind of how human beings work. We look for reasons, we look for motivations. So, you know, they're gonna be thinking, uh, you know, Gristle has Stockholm syndrome that she's just like, like, yeah, she's on the side of her tormentor because she was isolated with him for too long, or she is kind of a masochist or something. And they're going to look at the Marquis and go, he's got this kind of compulsive behavior that he doesn't really want to do. He's got some kind of a psychological problem where he has like this horrible, um, he's got like a horrible low self-esteem and he's got to keep proving that she loves him by testing her you know so your audience is going to like try to come up with that if you don't come up with it as a production um 
maybe that's what you want, but that's what I see happening. Mm. Alexandra. Yes, that. Excellent. Um, <laughs> okay, let's go into Act Five, Scene Two. Uh, we have the return of the Marquis uh, Pavia, who we haven't seen for most of the play. Uh, Lepido, Onifrio, uh, Ocenze, Farnese, and Mario. Lords, as you love our state, affect our loves. Like of your own content, respect your lives. Urge us no further. Walter is resolved to marry the half-heir of Brandenburg. My brother Pavia, with no small expense, hath brought the princess out of Germany, together with Prince Walter, her young brother. Now they are come, learn of the rising sun. Scatter the cloudy mists of discontent, as he, disperse, as he disperseth vapours with his beams. A brother, there is no eye but brightly shines, gladneth doth lodge in all your nobles' looks, nor have they any cause to cloud their brows. Enter Sir Owen, Gwynethian, and a Reese with wands. Oh, here comes Sir Owen and my lady. Patience. Room there. Perwark, cousin Marquis, and lords all. Welcome, good cousin Gwenthian. Will you go in and lend your presence to my bride? Cousin, tis her intentions to do so, but I swear and I will, and I will gristle, I would pull her eyes out as, and she were as many um, shortman's daughter as there be cows in Cambria. And that is above 20 score and a little more, you know, Sir Owen. Yes, truly, above a dozen more, I warrant her. Grizzle is patient, madam. Be you pleased? Well, and she be so basely minded as well, but I know what I know. Sir Owen here thinks to make Gwentian so patient, Sir Owen. It is all in various. Well, I go to her rights. Exit, Gwentian. You prayed and tore, Gwentian, but I made you out of the perils for all your talk and trade. Reese, where is Reese? Bring the ones here, Reese. They are here, sir, in the twinkling of an eye. Cousin, when her weddings are done at leisures, I will learn your medicines to tame shrews. You shall anon, good cousin Meredith. Stand by, Reese. Walk in the halls among the serving nuns. Keep her wands till I call. Hear you now? Yes, sir. Exit Reese. Enter Furio. Furio, are Grisil and the others come? And the other come? Yes, they are come. Are they employed according to our charge? They are. How does her brother take it? Ill. How her father? Well. How herself? Better. Furio, go call out Grisil from the bride. I will. Exit Furio. Oh, it's pity that fellow was not made a soldier. We should have had but a word and a blow at his hands. Enter Janiculo and Babulo carrying coals. Lorio with wood, Gristle with wood. A master, go you but under the coal staff. Babulo can bear all, staff, basket and all. It's the Marquis's pleasure. I must drudge. Load me, I pray thee. I am born to bear. But I'll no longer bear a loggerhead. Thus I'll cast down this fuel in despite. So though my heart be sad, my shoulders light. Alas, what do you, brother? See you not our dread lord yonder? Come, perform his will. Oh, in a subject this is too, too ill. What means thou, fellow, to cast down thy load? I have cast down my burthen, not my load. The load of your gross wrongs lies here like lead. What fellow is this? Your handmaid Gristle's brother. Take him away into the porter's lodge. Lodge me in dungeons. I will still exclaim on Walter's cursed acts and hated name. Oh, exit Lorio with Mario. Gristle, take you his load and bear it in. Oh, tiger-minded, monstrous Marquis, make thy lady a collier. 
What's that? That villain prates so. Oh, God bless the noble Marquis. Sirrah. Take you his coals. Grisil, depart. Return, but bear that first. With all my heart. Enter Grisil and Babulo grinning at him. Stay you, Juniculo. I have heard you sing. I could have sung when I was free from care. What grief can in your aged bosom lie? Grief that I am ungracious in your eye. Oh, then would he not desire your company? Re-enter Grissel. Janiculo, here is a bridal song. Play you the lark to greet my blessed son. Grissel, are you returned? Play you the morning to lead forth Gratiana, my bright bride. Go in and wait on her. Janiculo, sing Hymenaeus' hymns. Music, I say. Exit Grissel. Toss and toss and cousins all, and here her soul fast. And we have the song. Um, asking Juniculo to sing. Yeah, so it's Juniculo again. Is the song songsmith uh, seems to be the uh, the way this uh, this play is going. Um, Beauty, her eyes show forth thy glorious shining. Thine eyes feed law, for them he standeth pining. Honour and youth attend to do their duty, to thee their only sovereign, beauty. Beauty, arise, whilst we, thy servants, sing. I owe to Hymen, wedlock's jocund king. <laughs> I owe to Hymen, I owe, I owe, sing of wedlock, love and youth, his Hymen king. Beauty, arise, thy glorious lights display, while we sing, I owe, glad to see this day. I owe, I owe to Hymen, I owe, I owe, sing of wedlock, love and youth, this Hymen king. Art thou as glad in soul as in thy song? Who can be glad when he endureth wrong? It's cut utch me. Janicus is honest man. He does not flatter and sembles, but tells his intentions. How? More melodies. Oh, there comes her new pride. And music sounds, and we have uh, some entrances. So, uh, yeah, we've got some uh, some new uh, uh, horriblenesses going on here. Uh, I did like the exchange between the Marquis and Furio. I I was quite interested in how that could be performed because it, it you know the 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 curtness of the replies from Furio and the the the, the pacing of that. There's, there's a lot of play that can be had with that. Um, I, I just uh, the the sort of weird fascist dictatorness of the Marquis. Uh, the more we go on, just the way the the sycophancy that's being played out here, you know, with Pavia just going, "Oh yes, of, yes, my brother," um, and um, also <gasps> just just uh, Lorio being um, yeah bundled off. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we were saying earlier that looked like what yeah. it was, his function was there to be critical, and uh, and it looks like he's timed his he's he's left it late in the day, but he's uh, he's timed it well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, any thoughts, uh, Lynn? Yeah, so Pavia is really weird because um, he either doesn't actually have a daughter or he's kind of in on this masquerade. I mean, he doesn't have to suck up to the Marquis. He's a, he's a fellow head of state. So it's kind of hard to know what the hell's going on with him. Mm, I think yes. he is in on this. Yeah, that's, that would explain it. Yeah. Mm, depending on what this is, but no spoilers yeah. if you know where it's going. <laughs> um, uh, Alexandra. Um, I just wanted to point out, without knowing where it's going, I think uh, this play, this scene especially, illustrates really nicely um, how this abusive person, in the case of the Marquis, is can be abusive to his wife, uh, well, to a person, in public, in a way that is sort of aided and, and supported by other characters by all the other characters simply by nobody protesting and whoever protests getting summarily uh, sent away so i think even if you are equal heads of state sometimes even if you're in a higher position you won't want to challenge someone whom you see uh, doing something you know that you consider abusive behavior in not necessarily marital abuse um you won't want to be the person challenging them because that brings their their attention and their fury and their potential terribleness onto you. And even if you have power, you don't want to be that guy, which I thought was interesting in 
in this context. Of, of... Mm, yes, and mm. in the context of uh, uh, former meetings of the G8. Um, so it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, also, just Babulo's uh, moment as well when he says something, but he immediately goes to um, the, the exit of Babulo grinning at him. Yeah, that's surely a deliberately comic rictus grin, isn't it? Is that, yes, I am absolutely, I didn't say anything yeah. bad at all, <laughs> kind of action. There's something quite, and uh, actually saying a little disturbing about that, and then getting Janiculo to sing. I mean, whoa, yeah. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, grinning in this period was not necessarily a big wide smile. In fact, most often it would, there was a negative valence to it because skulls were talked about grinning and dogs, when they show their teeth, are grinning. Mm. So he's like a dog showing his teeth. It's a, it's a, it's a threatening gesture. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. Mm. Uh, Alexandra, and then we'll move on further into the scene. Really briefly, but if we consider it to be grinning in the sense of Richter's smile, that links in a lot with um, the Marquis constantly demanding people be happy and cheerful mm. and mm. pleased. And it also locks into some, some sort of clown uh, routines that we've got. That you know, the idea of the the, the big smile and uh, that that might be at play there. You know, especially as Babylo is is explicitly labels himself as a clown but just a clown not fit for court that's just not where he's good uh he doesn't want to be there anyway we should move on music sounds enter gristle alone after her the marquis son and daughter uh, stage direction letting giving the game away a bit there uh julia and uh Gwenthian and other ladies mario and furio salute my beauteous love all joy betide, oh, Graziana, our dear oh, Marquis bride. bride. Bring me a crown of gold to crown my love, a wreath of willow for despised Gristle. Gristle is not despised in your eye, it's so thence you name her name so gin. Gwentian, there's wives, there's patient wives. Fur, fur is fools, tossing his errant pooby fools. Gristle. Place you this crown upon her head. Put these embroidered slippers on her feet. Mm, Tis well. Deliver me your wedding ring. Circle her finger with it. Now, stand by. Art thou contented with all? Content with all. My bride is crowned. Now tell me, all of you, which of you ever saw my love before? What is her name, her birthplace or estate? Till now, I never beheld her beauty. Nor I. Trust me, nor I. <laughs> By my troth, nor I. We hear that she was born in Germany and half heir to the Duke of Brandenburg. You all hear this and all think this? We, we do. do. We do. Furio, stand thou forth. <laughs> Lords, in his breast a loyal servant's true soul doth rest. Furio shall be apparelled in a robe. I shall not become it. Some that are great put robes on parasites. Mario Lepido, come you too hither. Are you not richly clad? Have I done so? Uh, what means your what grace? Means your grace by this? This? Great, let's have done. Truth seldom dwells in a still talking tongue. Furio, bring Lorio from the porter's lodge. Take in Geniculo. And clothe them both in rich habiliments. They shall a while be flattered with false fortune's wanton smile. Fortune can do no more than she hath done. They are marked to woe. To woe must run. Exuant Furio and Geniculo. How do you like my bride? I think her blessed to have the love of such a noble lord. You flatter me. Indeed, I speak the truth. Only I prostrately beseech your grace that you consider of her tender years, which, as a flower in spring, may soon be nipped with the least frost of cold adversity. Why are you not, then, nipped? You still seem fresh, as if adversity's cold, icy hand had never laid his fingers on your heart. It never touched my heart. Adversity dwells still within them that dwell with misery. Mild content hath eased me of that yoke. Patience hath borne the bruise and eyed the stroke. Enter Furio, Janiculo, and Lorio striving about attire. Give him his silks, they shall not touch my back. What strife is there? What aileth, Lorio? 
I will not wear proud trappings like a beast, yet hourly feel the scornful rider's spur. Clothes old Janiculo in rich attire. Do load me for to bear is my desire. You repine. Nay, then I'll vex you more. Grissel, I will receive this second wife from none but from thy hands. Come, give her me. I here present you with an endless bliss, rich honor, beauteous virtue, virtuous youth. Long live my lord with her contentedly. Uh, so Owen, random line. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, I am lost. Uh, hold, Mark. hold fast the hand of my bridery before. No. Oh, no, my mark patience. Uh, uh, mark patience, there, Grinthian. See you that. Grissel, dost thou deliver me this maid as an untainted flower, which I shall keep despite of envy's canker till the rust of all-consuming death finish her life? I do, my dear lord, and as willingly as I delivered up my maiden youth. Says Juniculo. I say but thus, great men are gods, and they have power o'er us. Grissel, hold fast the right hand of my bride, thou wearest a willow wreath, and she a crown. True bride, take thou the crown, and she the wreath. My gracious lord. Or do you do mistake yourself? Peace, peace, thou sycophant. Grissel, receive large interests for thy love and sufferance. Thou gavest me this fair maid. I, in exchange, return thee her, and this young gentleman, thy son and daughter. Kiss with patience and breathe thy virtuous spirit into their souls. Oh, Sir Owen, mark you now, the man is yielded to her lady. Learn now, Sir Owen, learn, learn. Knight, your duty, see you that? Stands my wronged gristle thus amazed. Joy, fear, love, hate, hope, doubts encompass me. Are, are these my children, I suppose I'd say? These my nephews that were murdered? Blessing distill on you like morning dew, my soul knit to your souls, knows you are mine. They are, and I am thine. Lords, look not strange. These two are they at whose birth envy's tongue darted envenomed stings. These are the fruit of this most virtuous tree. That multitude, that many-headed beast, nipped their sweet hearts with wrongs, with bitter wrongs. All you have wronged her. Myself have done most wrong, for I did try to break the temper of true Constance I. But these, whom all thought murdered, are alive. My Grissel lives, and in the book of fame all worlds in gold shall register her name. Most dreaded, Most dreaded Lord. Lord. Her eyes flatter us, get you gone. Your souls are made of black confusion. Father Janiculo. Oh, pardon me. So dumb betwixt my joy, grief and joy I be. Who stands the sad? What? Brother Lorio? What? Pardon. Brother Lorio? Pardon me, gracious Lord, for now I see that scholars with weak eyes pore on their books, but want true souls to judge on majesty. None else but kings can know the heart of kings. Henceforth my pride shall fly with humbler wings. Our pardon and our love circle thee round. Let's all to banquet. Mirth. Our cares confound. Hold, 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 banquet. If you banquet, Sir Owen is like to have cheer. Her lady here is cog a hoop now at this. Pray, cousin, keep your promise. Reese, wands, Reese, your medicines and fine tricks to tame shrews. Uh, Furio, where be the wa wands that I bound up? Here, my lord. 
I wreathed them then, Sir Owen, and you see they still continue. So wreathe you these three. Oh, wind them? Yes, is wind them and make good mighty cudgel to tame and knock her letty as she prowl or cry or give bread and meat to beggars or tear pawns. By God, is well remembered to cousin, you promised to help her to duck eggs for all her paper and pawns are torn. And I will keep my promise. Read your wands. Oh, God's lid, I mine is stubborn like Gwentian. God's blood, I see it breaks and snip and snap pieces. What now, cousin? But, cousin, these you see did gently bow. I tried my gristle's patience when twas green like a young osier, and I moulded it like wax to all impressions. Married men that long to tame their wives must curb them in before they need a bridle, then they'll prove all gristles, full of patience, full of love. Yet that old trial must be tempered so, lest seeking to tame them they master you. By God, is true as pistol and gospel, or oh, true out of cry. But you, Sir Owen, giving her the head as you gave liberty to those three wands, she'll break as those do if you bend her now. And then your past all help, for if you strive, you'll gain as gamesters do that seldom thrive. What shall do her lady then? Is past run away, cousin, or knock her brains out? For is valiant as Mars if I be anger? That were a shame, either to run away from a woman or to strike her. Your best physic, Sir Owen, is to wear a velvet hand, leaden ears, and no tongue. You must not fight, however see she quarrels. You must be deaf whensoever she brawls, and dumb when you yourself should brabble. Take this cordial next your heart every morning, and if your wife be not patient, the next remedy that I know is to buy your winding sheet. Cousin Marcus, cousin Julia, lords and ladies, all it shall not need, as her cousin has tried gristle, so Gwenthine has her own. Oh, by God, his thought should pull her down. <laughs> it's not pulled down either, but Sir Owen shall be her head, and uh, is sorry it has angered her head and made it, made it and make it ache but pray good night be not proud and triumph too much and tread her lady down god judge me we will take her will again do what i can by god is love her out of cry now sir owen could tame her before but british blood scorns to fight for ladies yes faith scorns out of cry a pox on it tis not Gwentian shall no more be called Gwentian, but patient Crusoe. Ah, uh -huh. is our joys are complete. Forward to our feast. Patience has won the prize, and now is blessed. Nay, brother, your pardon a while. Besides ourselves, there are a number here that have beheld Grissel's patience, your own trials, and Sir Owen's sufferance, Gwentian's frowardness, these gentlemen lovatine and myself a hater of love. Amongst this company, I trust, there are some maiden bachelors and virgin maidens, those that live in that freedom and love it, those that know the war of marriage and hate it, set their hands to my bill, which is rather to die a maid and lead apes in hell than to live a wife and be continually in hell. Julia, by your leaves, a little, you talk and you prabble about shidings and marriages and you abuse young men and damsels and freight them from good sports and honourable states. But hear you now, all that be assembled here, know you that discords make good music and when lovers fall out, is soon fall in and tis good, you know. Pray you all be married for wedlock increases peoples and cities, all you then that have husbands that would, you would prickle, or as set your hand to Gwentian's bill, for tis not fit that poor women should be kept always under. Since Julia 
of the maids and Gwenthian of froward wives entreat a kind applaud. See Grissel among all this multitude who will be friend to gentle patience. <laughs> Grissel is weary. Pray you let Sir Owen speak. Grissel is patient and her cousin is patient. Therefore is speak for two. Cot's blood, you see her lady is sprite of buttery. Yet Sir Owen tame her and tear her ruffs and make her cry and put on her perils and say is sorry Sir Owen. Mark that well. If Sir Owen was not patient, her lady had not been prideful. If Grissel had not been patient, her cousin Marquis had not been prideful. Well now, if you love Sir Owen's lady, I hope you love Sir Owen too, or is grow mighty angry. Sir Owen love you as God urge me, out a cry, a terrible deal. Do you know, do you hear now? Then pray, all that have crabbed husbands and cannot mend them as Grissel had, and all that have fixed wives and yet is tame her well enough as Sir Owen does, and all that have scolds as Sir Owen does, and all that love fair ladies as Sir Owen does, to set her two hands to his pill and by good shall have Sir Owen's heart and soul in his belly. So, and so God save you all, Man grass worth away, man grass worth away. Good night, cousins all. And they all live happily <laughs> ever after. Yeah. So I, I, let's just briefly unpack some of the action that we've just had there. So the Marquis having, you know, uh, stolen uh, the two uh, children of Grissel and uh, told her that they were dead. Then, you know, some... 15 plus years later um <laughs> sneaks them back in and pretend to pretend to marry them uh mar marry the daughter and then goes oh ta-da it's fine look look it's actually your daughter look look at this this thing it's everything is magically okay now because i did all of these things <laughs> and then you know he, uh, here have some nice clothes here have a present <laughs> You like the present, don't you? And Lorio, I'm disappointed in you, man. Come on. You just went, oh, I've got some nice things now. Oh, fine, fine. Yeah. And Julia uh, steps in to, to do some 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 stuff and uh, and the, the, the whole sewing. Oh, look. Bent, yeah, subtle rod thing. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> um... There's a few nice lines of dialogue. Um, but yeah, it, oh, deliver me your wedding ring. You know, put the wedding ring on my, my new intended. Um, but put put on the shoes, you know, do do all the stuff, you know. Just let, let me, as part of this ongoing test, just, just crank that knife and twist it and twist it as much as I can. So and they all live happily ever after. They're all fine now. They're all they're all happy. They're all happy. Or they're pretending to be happy because the Marquis is clearly mad. Um, Lois. Yeah. Yes, I was surprised actually that uh, these authors kept the time element because I mean I knew that was in Chaucer that years pass and that the the young bride uh, and Grissel does stress that she is very young. Uh, turns out to be her daughter i thought surely he'd think of they'd think of some way to uh to make uh, make it only a matter of months or something and just get somebody in, else to stand in for the bride but no uh i mean sure. it just doesn't make sense it's uh, uh i mean it's it's like the plot of another play that we can't really mention here where i think 16 years pass mm. before there's a <laughs> yes <laughs> but uh, uh you know all the all these stories where you have to have a, a, a lot of time passing or just really hard to take when you dramatize them as opposed to when you just say in a novel or poem you know 15 years past uh, and yeah it's appalling to think that he's left those people uh, making baskets all those years he's also it's, it's totally self-destructive as well i mean he's deprived himself essentially of uh, 15 years of company of the woman he adored apparently mm, yeah yeah 50 i mean i plucked 15 out of the air you know 15 yeah. 20 years you know um yeah. you know it's, and... it's couple Maybe of decades yeah. you know it's it's um yeah. so yeah I mean, we hadn't mark noticed a time change until literally how I, I got to this scene and went oh no of course no a lot of time must have passed at some point um and and we need to sort of you know production needs to make that decision as to where that that random time jump goes um 
he said. Uh, Eric? I I'm basically betting that sort of Gristle murders him in his sleep off stage. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I find it fascinating that they made the decision to sort of go, Julia, you're single, get married and shut up. Or mm. shut up and get married, depending mm. which way around you want it to sort of uh, be. But it just kind of, I don't know, it just, yeah, sort of. She doesn't. She's, that's what's great. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, she turns to the audience and go, hi, there are other options available to avoid this hell. You've just watched hell. This is hell. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, does, she, she does kind of remind me of another play we can't mention yeah let, let's stop doing to... that let's stop doing oh, that sorry. let's, let's just, no, walk away. just walk it, it's away it's kind of consoling yeah uh, I, I, the, the, there is interesting uh, uh grenthian's um a bit of just going hey have, having arguments um is sometimes fun because the makeup sex is great um <laughs> it, it seems to be what she's saying there and so there are little snippets where every so often i'm going i'm with this and then 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 you look at the rest of it and go no maybe i'm not maybe i'm not here um yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Lois. Yeah, I think you can take it that uh, Loria's uh, apparently apologetic uh, conciliatory speech may be, uh, you know, just muttered <laughs> rather than uh, kind of a wholehearted acceptance of the situation. Um, I can't even make out exactly what Sir Owen's speech is about. I mean, I think this is mainly that this is presumably a popular character or a popular actor who is now uh, just kind uh -huh. of doing his shtick and uh, encouraging the audience to to applaud because they love him so much. Well, you know, if you love me, you know, yeah. and you love ladies and you love things yeah. and you love yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just in that 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 uh, uh, that repetition <laughs> of as so Owen does, yeah. um, then then applaud, applaud, God damn it, please dear God, applaud, uh, Alexandra. <laughs> Is this basically just a, a I, I don't know the word for it, but an, an, a slide into the epilogue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. In that case, when does it start? At mm. what point are we supposed to be cheering because the play was good? And, f and uh, at what until that point are we cheering because we agree with the character? Because I think there's, if it is that sort of transition, then it's actually quite interesting that, you know, you get someone like Julia going, how about not reproducing? That's, that would be great too. Or not getting married is actually what she suggests. Um, and um, then Gwenthian sort of speak mm -hmm. for forward wives. Um, mm. And they, as, as the Marcus points out, they, they both are supposed to receive a kind applause. But um, I also wanted to point out how the Marquis actively gives the last word to Grissel and it gets taken away from her mm. by another one of the men. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's just ha ha ha. Grissel is weary. Uh, weary. Um, mm. Let me speak. Yeah. Um, mm. And yeah, there's, there's, there's something nightmarish about this whole scenario because they're, 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 they're just looking at all of the reactions of just it. Of, if, it, I, I know this probably this wasn't the intention, I'm sure, but it does feel like they're just there's a firing squad just to one side of the you know just waiting for them to say the wrong thing, as <laughs> as, as the Marquis's stage managed this great production that's going to end his massive social experiment, and everyone's going to be happy, aren't you? Um, <laughs> nurse to it all. Um, it, yeah, uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean. That, that is a very long epilogue, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. the, the Marquis has his uh, uh, rhyming couplet, which sounds sort of like the end of the play, especially with a line like, Patience hath won the prize and now is blessed. And then Julia comes in with, hey, brother, your pardon a while. In fact, I'd be inclined to have her say your patience a while. But uh, uh, And then clearly that next bit between our, besides ourselves, there are a number here that have beheld this. That must mean the audience. It's mm. clearly turning out to them. And then... Then we get, you know, all these different contradictory things. But yeah, I wonder if you could do anything with that bit that uh, inspires Sir Owen to say Gristle is weary. I mean, does she just refuse to speak, in fact, at that point? Mm. Yes, the, the, it is this uh, sort of never ending um, um, epilogue match, isn't it? Uh, mm. that, that, that we go from that. Um that they're all sort of stepping in front of each other. We haven't had this number of uh, sort of uh, false endings since uh, gentleness and nobility. Uh, Eric. 
I find it interesting, like the Marquess just goes, yeah, let's go celebrate, you know, we, we're all sort of, um, let's to banquet and uh, mirth our cares confound. And then Sir Odin's like, wait a minute, we still have props and plot points we haven't resolved yet. Um, it just, um, yeah, I don't know, just sort of. Yeah, the Marquess why, why is like, yes, I bring I'm these forgiven, sticks? it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it just, b before anything can sort of, um, it's like he wants it over and done with before anything can actually like the shock can you know pass or something i don't know i don't know how you would produce this without like people demanding well not demanding their money back but sort of not paying to see it <laughs> yeah i mean yeah we've got essentially three plus false endings to this and that's interesting the idea that marquis is trying to end the show and the other characters aren't letting him there's something interesting there. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, that is interesting. That, that I've just been sitting here kind of meditating on that. It's kind of as if um, the play keeps trying different endings because it's going, it's trying to to close things off in a in a in a way that feels reconciled or resolved or or some kind of return to, to equilibrium. And it can't. I can't it's like we keep trying to end it in a satisfactory way but there, there's no way to do it because the story's so fucked up mm. uh yeah uh alexandra were you waving earlier uh, no oh I, I wanted to point out a couple of things that we've been saying in the chat um and also that uh you're your idea, Robert, of, of there's a firing squad just off visible on the side of the stage so that people are desperately trying to keep the Marquis satisfied, a sort of, you know, Marat Saad type situation. Um, also, uh, in the chat, we were talking about 1984, um, you know, a sort of 1599 um, kind of, uh, I, I don't know, presentation of this, the idea that maybe over the course of these 15 years or however long it's been since they got married not since the children were born um maybe what's been happening is the marquis has just been an absolute tyrant to everyone in this marquisate in this in this part of the world and we you know in a modern production you would show much more of the world being affected and shutting up because it's very risky um so that this public kind of congratulation and redemption of his wife is actually a very nail-biting situation for everyone mm, yeah i mean we've got this moment when um lepido and mario so these, what i'm the, saying is oh. intentionally unsatisfying sorry you you cut out and i sh i thought you'd finished i'm sorry about that i was saying so what i'm saying is making it intentionally unsatisfying and i just it's what what sprang to mind there was beckett um mm. is that some productions of uh writings of samuel beckett hmm. yeah I'd, and there's, there's that, that moment um of lepido and mario when you know these flatterers who you know we've been signaled are going to get their comeuppance and you know it's just uh arise flatterers get you gone your souls are made of black confusion exit that's it that's literally it for the which and that's been set up from very early in the play and they get two lines mm. on that um mm. i have to say in my in my head uh production that they're, they're, they're just they're just shot <laughs> they, they don't exit it's just bang bang they're dead and then Janic father janiculo oh pardon me you know i i, I I'm, I'm seeing a very very dark show here um that is seems to be the only route through here, this um uh, at the moment uh, uh for for this text and the the text is inviting it in places so it's not like it's entirely made up. I, I do think the authors are genuinely not sure what the hell to do with this plot. Uh, hmm. uh, Eric? Well, also, Babylon doesn't come back, so you mm -hmm. kind of assume <laughs> that he, he's either dead or he just <laughs> managed to break free of this situation. Uh, I mean, I would opt for the second one just because I think uh, he deserves to be happy. But maybe that's... <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time they've killed the clown, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you smile as much as you like, mate. You smile forever. Uh, you'll be grinning on the other side of your face. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, that's really an interesting observation that the Bobula doesn't come back on. Yeah. It's straining credibility a little that the brother, the Lorio, uh, changes his mind and says, oh, you're my brother-in-law now, and 
and we're cool, but it's hard to imagine Bobulo giving up his defiant stance and, and saying, oh, you've made my mistress uh, rich and, and, and you've taken her back into your good graces. I guess I forgive you. It's, it, yeah, you can't see him saying this. We're just going to leave him out of this scene. Mm. <laughs> and also we've got two supernumeraries coming on who don't say anything. The, 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 the son and daughter, uh, there's no mother uh, you know, or uh, or anything, they they don't say a word. Um, Do they even know who they are. Yeah, but have been sworn to silence. Do they find out in this moment who they really are? Mm. Have they been fed on fish heads for the last? Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. just a bucket, just tossing <laughs> through through the the hole in the the, the floor into the dungeons. <laughs> You know what? What's what's what? What horrific Marquis um, torture has he he done on them? Who knows? Um, okay, final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just quickly go around the room. Uh, if you have nothing additional to add, feel free to just just move on. I I, I think that's that's very legitimate. But uh, we'll see what comes out. Eric, uh, any final thoughts? I seem to remember that last in, in the. other other version of patient bristle we were wanting to murder the marquis by you know about halfway through and i don't think this one made me feel any different from that one um maybe even worse because like it, the, the authors are aware of it and they, they can't seem to fix the problem i don't know if it's just that uh, the sort of story was so popular as we've discussed before but it just kind of didn't they didn't try to imagine a, a different ending um Mm. yeah i don't know it's it's there's a part of me going i would be intrigued to see how like, it's an interesting challenge to take the story and actually maybe play around with it and change sort of um what's it called uh change certain elements and see what happens but i don't know if it's <laughs> well yeah it's uh it's uh i, I mean I'm, if i if it's a nightmare then possibly um but yeah it's i i can't see it getting in its entirety of laughs uh, i can see bits of it being used for laughs in an isolated separated context um but you know a lot of this tonally is quite funny um and you know mixed in with the stuff that is incredibly um Hmm. Uh, I'll say there. I'll use that 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 technical term. Uh, Elizabeth, any final thoughts? Yeah. Um. I was just. I was really thinking about like the fact, the fact of an early modern play, and how it it will it doesn't necessarily fit our modern, um, or postmodern, um, desires for a play. You know, and this and this, you know, we talked about the unsatisfying ending. We have the character of the Marquis, who is so um, unyielding, who almost seems to be out meta outside of the play itself because he's so, you know, specifically anti, and he stays that way to the very, very end of the play. And then we have Grizel, who is so un almost unnaturally patient that it's ridiculous and then we find you know one of the things that was discussed from the thoughts of the readers was that the play's ending was unsatisfying and i was thinking to myself that that's not the only play that we've done that has got, had an unsatisfying ending and and maybe that can be something that we could put on our early modern bingo because the unsatisfying ending and the 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 almost tonal shifts in the text because it goes from comedic to tragic to god knows what um mean all those things i think are what contributes to it being early modern and to being something other than what we as a modern or postmodern audience would enjoy and i i would loathe to put a blue pencil to any of this and try and fix it because i think that it is uh, is of its kind it's of its type and a lot of the things that we complained about are of their time so that an audience of the time would have understood it and got it much better than we do now mm. i mean that's the question can could could we curate a season whereby you know we we represent texts as they are with you know just heavily 
content warned uh, for the audience before they go in, saying, "Look, this is this is to show you what the world was like, rather than uh, to say this is because the thing is we've had excellent discussions this week, actually, um, and fielding this with that kind of post show or around show uh, additional material." Um, the, the, there might be something fruitful here, but it also, um, it, it, uh, also, I, I say in a weird say, it's, I do see a production here. I just see it as a horrific tragedy. Uh, <laughs> it's not a comedy, and that makes what you do with the comedy a really interesting question. Um, so, in the sense, you don't have to change a word without making a completely different play to what the early modern would intend. I mean, that, and that's the sense. We can't recreate the early modern, even if we don't change a single word. Yeah. the simple reality of performing it now means it's a totally different text because the audience will not respond to it in the way that an early modern audience would. It's the sort of the, the, the inevitable trap that we, we, we have. Uh, yeah. Lynn, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, so I said something yesterday about there's almost something sort of self-aware or metatheatrical about it. I've been thinking about that a lot Uh over the past couple of days, it's a, it, plays that comment on theater are almost as old as drama, as far as we can tell. You know, we did The Night of the Burning Pestle a couple of weeks ago, where it, it looks like it's trying to mock theater and theater goers and just fails because the theater is a place of health and of togetherness. Um, and, uh, it, and in more modern times, we have a play like Timberlake, Wurton Baker's our country's good. And the whole point of, of that story is that collective creative endeavor humanizes us or uh, um, into the woods, you know, Sondheim and, and others. Careful, the thing you say, children will listen, um, but tell stories. It's so important to tell stories. So it, the the device of a play with about a play, writing about writing, theater about theater that shows the power that the theater has is something that happens. And, and I think this has potential to be a, a kind of a version of that, but in a very, but in a more negative way, careful, the stories you tell, careful, the values that you promote, because people will listen. Uh, it, it, you know, so if you could kind of layer a metaphysical frame around this, where the, the authors are saying, no, no, it's fine. Everybody loves this story. And the actors are going, are you sure? Because it's gross. <laughs> um, I, I I wonder if you you could make this text the, the core of a, a a kind of commentary on the the power of of performance to do harm if we're not careful what stories we tell. Mm. Uh, Bryony, any final thoughts? So many. I'm trying to wrangle them into some sort of coherence. For me, this play is, is just saying some really interesting things about like submission and obedience and the way, and not just in in your gender, especially at this time within a marriage, you have to submit to each other in different ways, but also the way that, that poor people always have to submit to the rich. And so at the very top of this is the Marquis pulling all these strings. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether some of the reasons, some of the way it's not been resolved satisfactorily for us is maybe to do with the fact that the, the playwrights themselves will have been somewhere in this hierarchy of submission and obedience. And there's only so much that they can safely say outright about some of these issues. Um, and so I don't know, I, I just find this such a fascinating piece of writing. I'm struggling to see it, how how it could work as a performance because I'm, I've just, the writing itself there's there's messages in there and i think it's how you would dig them out how you would present them and i don't think you would have to necessarily edit it as much as give it context mm. Mm. uh lois any final thoughts mm. uh, it's complicated i mean that fable of the wands which can be bent when they're green but are stiff when they're uh older uh I mean, it's sort of typical of the sort of fable-like quality of this thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact that it, the, we have these two plots, the patient woman plot and the shrew plot, um, makes one think, um, Alexandra's already mentioned the a shrew and the tamer tamed. 
I mean, in The Tamer Tamed, you've got the woman behaving badly to her husband and then saying at the end that she intends to be obedient to him, which is pretty much what Gwenthian does in this play. Uh, and I think the, the writers of A Shrew did actually give it a metatheatrical framework so that uh, uh, the artificiality of the story was perhaps more obvious. They also brought in uh, a bit right at the end where uh, someone says to, to Bianca, you know, you're a shrew. Well, she's the Bianca character and she says that's better than a sheep. And uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, like the sort of comment on the, the whole end of this play. I mean, I, it's possible that putting them together in some sort of season might might make it easier to to see what this one is doing. I mean, that they're all really just extreme uh, test cases. Uh, and, you know, the problem in it is really the time factor, uh, you know, the fact that uh, something which, uh, I don't think one finds it a problem really in uh, The Tamer Tamed, partly because it's a woman behaving badly to a man instead. Uh, and one doesn't have a very clear sense in that play of how long the whole thing is going on for. Uh, it doesn't seem to be terribly long, uh, but uh, uh, in this play, it does seem to me that uh, there's a there's a real problem with how you can make the the ending happy given the amount of time that's passed. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting actually how we sort of when we were doing Taming of a Shrew, we approached it with trepidation, going, "Oh dear God, this is going to be awful." Uh, and weirdly, it's, uh, the framing device seemed to give it a, something of a pass. It, it, it came off a lot better than actually we were expecting before we went into the room. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that that, that is a distancing device um makes everyone feel just slightly more comfortable which in a sense is a bad thing because it means like hey it's fine we've given this lovely coating of sugar so that you, the the misogyny goes down um uh, so uh, it's it's uh, it's sort of one of those uh, the, the, those those contradictions sometimes uh Lalit, any final thoughts yeah actually what lois was saying about the responsibility of performance i suddenly kept thinking about punch and judy and how Punch and Judy shows, I think, have completely disappeared for good reason. But they were a big part of my childhood. And you know, they tend to kind of get excused because they they occupy this weird sort of fictional fantasy space. So they're just meant to kind of accept it as not representing reality. But of course it does. And um, yeah, I, I don't know how much of yeah, this play. I mean, I've only seen the last bit, and they're, obviously they're, they're 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 nice, dissenting voices in it, um, like Julia's, and um, and the, and the whole you know the, the 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 class the class aspect where people kind of resent being told what to do by the the, the Lord. Um, but yeah, mitigate against it. I'm I'm not sure what would be gained from staging it. I it's just so unpalatable. <laughs> um, I think you can certainly play Griselda is completely nuts <laughs> um, because you know she's you know she's just not in a healthy sense um, it's a it's a play about sexism right so I've got a curious daughter yeah. uh, uh, Alan any final thoughts yeah I mean there's some very well written sequences in it um, I got completely thrown by the time jump or time warp that happens somewhere towards the end of it, which just renders the whole thing, in my view, totally implausible. Um, and basically the base plot, I think I would be circular filing cabinet. Um, nick the few sequences out of it that work and use them for something else. I don't think it's stageable as a piece as a whole. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely curious to see because there is an element of, you know, d doing it to find out whether that's a true statement or not. Um, I mean, there is an element of uh, we can second guess people. You know, if we if you signpost exactly what this text is, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and treat a potential audience as as adults in that that way. Um, are we are we missing the possibility of of extending these kind of discussions that we're having here, or is there a, a better or other way of doing it? Um, I mean, certainly in terms of structurally, as an overall piece of uh, of, of you know, dramaturgically and the way it's put together, it's it, it functions incredibly well. considering there are three authors as well, um, tonally it's very consistent. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, in terms of the writing. I don't feel that uh, suddenly I've gone, oh, this bit's by X or this bit's by Y. It does feel like they've actually managed to work together to create a very cohesive thing. Um, um, but, you know, we don't have the final word on any of those things. Uh, Eric, and uh, then I'll go to Alexandra. Sorry for cutting in, but I just remembered. Well, like we we have we've had similar issues with other plays. I mean, not just the domestic abuse season, so to speak, as uh, Alexander put it in the chat. But um, like plays like game game of chess with uh, by Middleton, where you you've got situations uh, which are kind of like you know there, there's sexual abuse, uh, and you're like the characters kind of don't really address it, but also don't fully glorify it, but also it, obviously, that's uh, that play is doing something very different, um, but it's sort of, yeah, how do you perform these plays that are very much of their time, but also interesting dramatically is kind of a very, very big can of worms. <laughs> but it's it's an interesting discussion. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the difference between uh, this and a uh, play like a uh, game of chess is of course that the the, the 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 signposted bad people who do the bad things get put in a bag at the end whereas here they get a party um and and get away scot-free and it's sort of that question you know sometimes a play is about an issue and sometimes uh, a thing reinforces an issue and would a production reinforce or would it comment on um or would our production or uh, putative future productions uh, alexandra yeah, just following on from that, I think the the important thing would be for the putative production to be very clear about the fact that this is not, the production is not supporting this behavior. The production is indicating within the story that this is unfair and that it's an inescapable situation. Um, so that what you then get is, you know, this is why I was making references to 1984, because I agree with you uh, that it's very well written. It's, I feel like this is, this one's written better than the last Grizzle I read, uh, the last 27. Um, but um, I think especially the, what I've noticed in this one is the abuse is very well written. As, I mean, chillingly so. Um, and I think it shouldn't be made satisfying. I think the fact that it's unsatisfying at the end is the point, that it's trying really hard to get to a satisfying conclusion and it just can't um, because you cannot get to a satisfying conclusion after that. Um, and I think, you know, you, if you do it as a heartbreaking tragedy with really good comedy in it, then as an audience you get relief which plunges you deeper into the into the sort of sorrow um or the, the that feeling of of um uh, what did i say injustice that you're witnessing and can't contribute to um which i think would make for some very interesting um you know thoughts on the drive home but um I think for that, for that to work, for it to work as a story that we care about rather than for us to switch off because I've had enough of this and nothing's changing, um, we need a Grizzle to care about. Um, and I think if the character remains flat throughout, we will lose interest. So we need something in her to be characterful. I would go for conflict of some description, internal conflict, give her, find a reason, find a way of illustrating that she is struggling with the struggles and managing to overcome them with more and more effort um, so that she is being changed by the end. And so is the Marquis and so are the people around. Um, because otherwise, she's she's an embodiment of a of an immobile and an in an inactive principle, which is one really hard to act inactive, um, and of course it's it's really hard to care about. Hmm. But there's an element of looking at this almost as a post dramatic text. There's actually that the, there's the trying to do something with the text as a uh, as a presentational vehicle rather than trying to produce the play. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested in this kind of text is something that you slightly explode and do other things with. And there might be something there uh, as well. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I'm just wondering if Gristle is as impossible as all that. I, whenever I've seen plays where there was a, uh, an incredibly virtuous character, I found my eyes riveted to them. And uh, 
I think it's partly just that it's uh, so unlikely. You know, you don't normally, when you're watching a play, think, gosh, this person is really good. But, uh, uh, you know, but that's sort of what it's about, you know, is everybody watching her, waiting for her to crack or start screaming at the Marquis or something. Uh, I think it, I mean, the trouble is it just goes on too long. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, could, I could sort of see that working for about half the play. But uh, I don't know, it's, uh, uh, it just seems to me it might, it might work. Well, I think there's also the the the, the question about you know uh, Grissel here is possibly solved by the fact that she's not on as much as you think she is. Mm. Um, that actually the it's it's uh, spoken of you know frequently asked to leave the stage stuff other stuff happens and then comes back on again. Um, so there is an element there that actually. And, and to the same degree, the Marquis, actually, they're surprisingly absent from their own play, um, which often comes as a blessed relief. Um, Eric, uh, and then I'm about to close the session. Well, I was going to say that there is, like, you could play it in a, you, because um, Gristle doesn't really change her stance in the same way that, for example, tragic heroines like Antigone don't change their stance. The only difference is that Antigone is outspoken and willing to die for it. Um, and obviously you've got things like, you know, patient Grizzle and uh, yeah, you like Grizzle's thing is that she's patient. It's that fatal flaw thing. Uh, so you could, you could do it that way. Yes, Sorry, Eric, Eric Antigone is active. Yeah, she's that's trying to persuade other people to do something. Uh, Gr Gristle doesn't. I mean, that's 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 the, the yeah that 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 element there. Sorry, I have to shut you down because I have to shut down the session. Um, but I think I feel we could probably discuss this at greater length, but sadly we cannot. So all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Ass, I'll have you snaffled.